The Lamb and the Scroll. If chapter 4 shows us the worship of God the Father, chapter 5 shows us Jesus, the worship of Jesus. God the Father holds up a scroll with seven seals, and a strong angel proclaims, Who is worthy to open the scroll and break the seals? But no one in heaven or on earth or under the earth is able to open the scroll. Then one of the elders says to John, Weep not. Behold, the Lion of the tribe of Judah, the Root of David, is conquered, so he can open the scroll and its seven seals. Lion of the tribe of Judah, Root of David, these are two royal titles for Jesus, showing that he sits on David's throne. He's from David's house of the tribe of Judah, described in Genesis as a lion. And he's not only the son of David, he's also the Root of David, David's creator. So, John gets on his tippy toes to try and see this conquering king, this roaring lion of the tribe of Judah. And what does he see? A lamb. A slaughtered lamb. A lamb, a lamb standing as though it had been slain. Usually slain lambs don't stand up. <laughs> Jesus was slain as an offering for our sins, but he's standing because he's been resurrected. The lamb has seven horns and seven eyes. Seven, we know, is the number of completeness and perfection. Horns are power. Eyes are knowledge. So, Jesus the lamb is all-powerful and all-knowing. In other words, he is God and worthy of all praise. Jesus picks up the scroll. The 24 elders pick up their harps and sing him a new song of praise, a song that is taken up by all the countless angels and saints of heaven. This is meant to make us think of the book of Exodus, when the Israelites walk through the Red Sea on dry land and Miriam picks up her tambourine and leads Israel in a new song of praise to God. How is the book of Revelation a new Exodus story? Can anyone think of a connection there? We're all exiting. <laughs> We're all on a journey to a new kingdom. We're on a journey to the new kingdom, to the promised land, right? All right, here's a few parallels. Both books start out with God's people suffering persecution. So what does God do? He sends plagues. He comes in judgment. He also sends a savior. We see before us a new Passover. A lamb who has been slain, and by his blood the people are saved from death. God rescues his people and brings them to a place where they can live in his presence and worship him. In the Exodus story, it's the promised land. In the book of Revelation, it's heaven. So you can keep that one in mind. Revelation is a new Exodus story. Now, here's the big question that Phil asked at the very beginning. What is the scroll? The scroll is the word of God. In particular, it is all of God's covenant promises made in Scripture. It is written on the front and the back like the Ten Commandments. It's meant to evoke all of God's covenant promises. Now the question being asked is, who is going to carry them out? Who has the power to fulfill all this, to make it all come true? Here's another level. The scroll is in the form of a will. Roman wills were sealed with seven seals. Literally, this scroll is the will of God, pun intended. So, all those promises he made to people throughout Scripture, to bless and to curse, mercy and justice, to make things right, to give the gift of eternal life to people who will accept him. This will is going to be executed. And who's the executor of this will? Jesus, the son and heir. He will carry out all the promises of the Father. And he's going to do it right now. Before we move on to Judgment Day, anything else in Chapter 5? Any other questions about the scroll? 
Yeah, think about it this way. Jesus isn't reading the scroll out loud at this point. He's just cracked open one of the seals. And, and it's not like John seeing a, you know, trying to get it open so that he can see the picture of the white horse in there. No, no, the white horse is outside the scroll. So something happens at, at the point that every seal mm -hmm. is taken up. Mm -hmm. The scroll remains fully closed until the last one is. Yes. It's each, each seal brings a new judgment upon earth. And then, you know, the grand finale, of course, is what happens when the last seal is open. We'll get there at the end. Because the scroll is not being read. If no. you go, if you read further, yeah. they never open up the scroll and read it. No, Jesus knows what it says. <laughs> but I, I thank you for bringing up picture language. That's a really important point that God likes to speak to his people in pictures, especially when we're talking about visions. These images all communicate truths, sometimes layers of them. So thank you. All right. Now, let's talk about God's judgment. There's going to be a lot of it in the book of Revelation. And most of us don't like to talk about God's judgment. God's judgment can seem to be a contradiction of God's love, like Eva was talking about. What if that wasn't the case? What if God's judgment is an expression of God's tremendous love for us and for everyone here on earth? That's not the case for us. We're told, judge not lest he be judged. We're told, you take the beam out of your own eye before you even think about taking out the speck in someone else's eye. We are told to judge very carefully or not at all. As a general rule, when do we judge? Well, we arbitrate between our own children when they're fighting, that's for sure. We judge if we're in the position of judge. We, we, sometimes we have to judge if we're in a position of authority. But boy, are we called to tread lightly. Boy, are we called to avoid any unnecessary judgments. So is God in that same position? No. Vengeance is mine, saith the Lord. God's judgment is justice. Yes, God's judgment is justice. This is an arbitrary judgment. This is justice. And I'm going to argue that God's judgment is an expression of his love, his overwhelming love. Here's how that works. How is God's judgment loving? You know how Father Timing has been talking about our difficult Sunday gospel readings from Luke lately? So here's one of them. Jesus says in Luke, I have come to cast fire on the earth, and how I wish it were already kindled. I think we heard that just two weeks ago. I had always taken that to mean that he was looking forward to the coming of the Holy Spirit, but that doesn't fit the context. Jesus continues, I have not come to bring peace, but a sword. It's that same passage, pitting, you know, mother-in-law against daughter-in-law and father against son. Jesus is talking about a destructive fire. Fire means light and warmth and the Holy Spirit, but let's not kid ourselves. It also means destruction. Our God is a consuming fire. He burns away what is useless so that new life can grow. That's what judgment looks like. Here's a fun little story. This past summer, Frank and I took the kids to Lake Tahoe. It was our first time there, and it was gorgeous. We got to ride the cable car up Heavenly Mountain. That's its real name. <laughs> so while we're riding the cable car, I'm looking around and appreciating the, the crystal clear lake down below, the alpine mountains, the, the, the forests, the rocky peaks, the blue sky, and the fact that we're, you know, riding through the sky in a cable car. Whee! I'm like a kid that way. And then my husband turns to me and says, this has got to burn. <laughs> I said, what? Now, here's the context. My husband's father was career forest service and a professional firefighter. My husband grew up in the middle of the forest. As a kid, he'd wander for miles, get tracked by mountain lions. He knows the forest. He loves the forest. And thanks to his dad, he knows plenty about how to properly care for the forest. So, Frank was looking down from our cable car over the forests we're going over, and he says, this is one of the unhealthiest forests I've ever seen. Nothing can grow here. Look at all this dead wood. 
I take a closer look down, and sure enough, on the ground are layers and layers of old dead trees, stripped bare, dead logs. There's no underbrush. There's no new trees. There's no new life whatsoever. I notice that the, the tall, beautiful trees I'd just been admiring, they're just a fraction of the ones that used to be there, and they're all old. They're losing bark. This forest is dying. And Frank was rather angry. He said if they cared about having a healthy forest, they should have burned this a long time ago. <laughs> when you burn a forest, you make room for new life to grow. There are times when God looks down from his heavenly mountain and says, there is too much dead wood here. It's time to clear the ground. <laughs> if God loved us less, he would look at the garden of our souls and say, eh, well, that part's dead. That part's overgrown, but oh well. If he loved us less, he would live and let live. But because he loves us more, he wants to make our souls into beautiful gardens. He wants to keep forming us into the people he created us to be. And that means destroying what is bad in us so that new life can grow. So we just looked at Hebrews 12 a short while ago. Hebrews 12 tells us about this cleansing fire in our own lives. It says, God is treating you as sons. For what son is there whom his father does not discipline? Whom he loves, he chastises. All discipline seems painful rather than pleasant at the time, but later it yields the peaceful fruit of righteousness to those who have been trained by it. I'm sure we can identify this in our own lives. Think back now. What in your own life has God burned up? Maybe it was painful, but God burned it up so that new life can grow. Now, here's another question. Is there anything in our lives right now that God wants to burn up so that new life can grow? I've got a couple simple examples here. I remember being called to a complete fast from TV and surfing the internet shortly before being called to teach these Monday night classes, you know, six years back. That fast didn't last forever, but God wanted to free me from that attachment. Go, okay, you gotta kick this out of your life because I got something better in mind for you and it's not gonna work unless you can go to this right now. I didn't even know what it was for at the time or what it was about, just knew that, what do you mean I can't watch TV anymore? <laughs> but God knew what he was doing. I also remember being called to take the Sabbath seriously, to put away my to-do list one day a week and rest. Work can be an attachment we need to be freed from, not because it's bad, but because it's not everything. There are absolutely times in our lives when God wants to burn away dead wood so new life can grow. God wants to burn away the destructive things in our lives. And sometimes he even has us give up good things in our lives, food or habits or activities, at least temporarily, because he's got something better in mind. That's the whole point of Lenten fasting. We work with God to clear out the dead wood, clear the ground, make room for new life to grow. That's not just something we save for Lent. That's part of the Christian life. We see God doing this in our own lives. Now, how does this look in salvation history? Think about the Babylonian captivity in 587 BC. God judged Israel for its idol worship. He allowed Jerusalem to be conquered and destroyed by Babylon. And he sent his people into exile because he loved them. To them, this was a horrible catastrophe. But in retrospect, they saw this was a cleansing fire. God's people came back 70 years later free from idol worship. It was never a problem for them again. Before that, it had been a problem for them for a thousand years. Fast forward to 70 AD. God judged the city of Jerusalem for its persecution of their Messiah and of his earliest followers. God judged his people not to punish them, but because he loved them. He wanted to bring them to repentance, and he wanted the persecutions to stop. Persecution of Christians in Jerusalem before 70 AD was so fierce, Christianity could have been smothered in its cradle, but it wasn't. 
Christians fled to the city of Pella in modern-day Jordan for safety and returned soon after. God's judgment of Jerusalem cleared the ground for new life. God's destruction of the temple paved the way for the new temple, his church. The message of Christianity spread. By several centuries later, Jerusalem's a thriving Christian city, and Christianity had spread across the Mediterranean world in the Middle East. That wouldn't have happened without God's cleansing judgment. He judges to bring new life. John wants his readers to know that's what God is doing right now. And then, there's what's going to happen at the end of time. To put it bluntly, there's not going to be a new heavens and a new earth until the old one goes up in flames. The seven seals are the beginning of judgment. They're the control burns of the book of Revelation. This is the beginning of the end. God is chastising his people. He is giving them a chance to repent. Jesus opens the first four seals. And what do we see? The four horsemen of the apocalypse. The first is conquest. A rider on a white horse holding a bow, wearing a crown who goes forth to conquer. The second is bloodshed. A rider on a red horse holding a great sword who is permitted to take peace from the earth. The third is famine. A rider on a black horse holding a scale and a voice saying, a quart of wheat for a denarius and a three quarts of barley for a denarius, but do not harm oil and wine. Those high prices indicate famine, but the fact that oil and wine are spared means it will not last long. And the fourth horseman is death, and hell follows with him. A rider on a pale horse, he is given power over a quarter of the earth, with not only war and famine, but also disease, wild beasts, and the text implies demonic attack. Again, there is heavy destruction, but not total destruction. These four horsemen of the apocalypse are angels. They first show up in the book of the prophet Zechariah. Funny enough, the situation there is reversed. It's the time of the return from exile in the prophet Zechariah. They're coming back from Babylon to Jerusalem. It's time to rebuild. At that time, God sends the four horsemen off to patrol the earth. They patrol the earth and report back, the earth is at rest. Zechariah is announcing that God's judgment is done and it is now time to go home and rebuild. These four horsemen show up again in 70 AD. These judgments in the six seals mirror those suffered by Jerusalem when it was conquered by the Romans. More on that in a moment. But remember also how Josephus said that shortly before the destruction of Jerusalem, people all over Israel were literally seeing ghost riders in the sky. I think it's very fair to connect them with these four horsemen of the apocalypse. I mean, were horsemen, were, were ghost riders literally riding around in the sky? I want to say based on the historical record, yeah, they probably were. People saw them. So how literal do you want to get with this? Huh? See, that wouldn't be very literal. <laughs> I'm taking it literally. I'm taking this as avenging angels. Finally, we can expect these four horsemen to show up again at the end of the world when the Great Tribulation comes. So, those are the first four seals. When Jesus opens the fifth seal, John sees the souls of the martyrs under the altar. They beg God, how long? How long before you judge and avenge our blood? They were each given a white robe and told, not yet, wait a little longer, until all those who are predestined for martyrdom have their turn, fill their quota, as Eva's translation said. The martyrs under the altar recall the blood of sacrifices on the altar of the temple. In other words, these martyrs are seen as making a sacrificial offering of their lives, of being as closely united to Jesus as is possible. So the martyrs, they're little Christs. Also in the early church, the people would sometimes celebrate the Eucharist in a graveyard, or in the catacombs where it used the tomb of a martyr for the altar. They would remember that martyr and ask for his or her prayers. This association between the tombs of the martyrs and the altars became so pronounced that up until very recently, it was customary to place the relics of a saint inside every altar in every church. 
I don't know if they're still doing it. I think they might have run out. I think the number of altars might have multiplied past the number of saints relics. St. Francis does not have them. <sighs> Sorry. Oh. Thanks for looking. I appreciate it. I just determined to find out. <laughs> And here we see the martyrs actually interceding for people on the earth. Specifically, they're asking God to bring about the end quickly. They're praying not out of hatred for their enemies, but out of a love for justice. Being near God, they share his feelings. They agree with him. They pray that judgment would come quickly and that sin would be destroyed forever so that God's people can live in peace and in complete union with God forever. I'm thinking of the bumper sticker, if you want peace, work for justice. But the idea of there being a peace, of being lasting peace in what at this point is a terribly unjust world, a world that is full of dead wood, a world that is crushing new life, that is persecuting Christians. Now the time for judgment has come, and that's going to be the way forward to a lasting peace. In between all of these scenes, of destruction and judgment. It's always bouncing immediately back to scenes of worship in heaven. It's almost as if we're being told, this may look, it may look like this is what's going on, but this is what's really going on. In, our, in the four chapters we read for today, one of those chapters has to do with judgment. Three of those chapters have to do with heavenly worship. And heavenly worship is our message for the day. In fact, I think I'll finish up the seven seals so I can get back to it. All right, here we go. The sixth seal. So we did the first five seals. The four horsemen of the apocalypse, the martyrs under the altar. The sixth seal brings about a great earthquake. The sky turns black. The moon turns to blood. The stars fall from the sky, and the sky is rolled up like a scroll. The people run for their lives and go hide in caves and call to the mountains, fall on us and hide us from the wrath of the Lamb. Just think about that for a moment. The wrath of the lamb. (laughs) As we heard in chapter 2, since the sun, moon, and stars are how the ancients told time, the destruction is a way of saying, time's up. Now the destruction of the sun, moon, and stars may well be literally fulfilled at the end of time. We shall see. But we know these six seals also refer to the destruction of Jerusalem in 70 AD. Why? because Jesus gives pretty much the exact same list of six devastations in his Olivet Discourse on the destruction of the temple in Matthew, Mark, and Luke. Turn to Luke 21, verses 9 through 12. Notice the context. This is when his disciples asked, Teacher, when will the temple be destroyed? And when you hear of wars and tumults, do not be terrified, for these things must first take place But the end will not be at once. Then he said to them, Nation will rise against nation, and kingdom against kingdom. There will be great earthquakes, and in various places famines and pestilences. And there will be terrors and great signs from heaven. But before all this, they will lay their hands on you and persecute you, delivering you up to the synagogues and prisons. And you will be brought before kings and governors for my name's sake. All right, in those few short verses we get wars, international strife, earthquakes, famine and plague, and persecution. First five seals. And if you skip ahead to verse 25, you get the sixth seal. And there will be signs in sun and moon and stars, and upon the earth distress of nations in perplexity, at the roaring of the sea and the waves, men fainting with fear and with foreboding of what is coming. The powers of the heaven will be shaken. And... You get the last part of the sixth seal in Luke 23, if you go forward. Jesus is carrying his cross, and the women of Jerusalem are weeping for him. And what does he say to them? Daughters of Jerusalem, do not weep for me, but weep for yourselves and for your children. For behold, the days are coming when they will say, Blessed are the barren, and the wombs that never bore, and the breasts that never nursed. Then they will begin to say to the mountains, fall on us, and to the hills, cover us. For if they do this when the wood is green, what will happen when it is dry? Sound familiar? 
Jesus is, what, what's, what's all this about green wood and dry wood? Well, it's kind of what we discussed earlier. Jesus is saying, if the leaders in Jerusalem are crucifying me now, when the wood is green, when Jerusalem is not yet ready for judgment, imagine how bad it's going to be a generation from now in the time of your children when the wood is dry. Then after the first six seals, you get a dramatic pause for effect. There's an interlude where you get God waiting, waiting for his people to repent. And in the meantime, John has a two-part vision of the saints. First, he sees them on earth. God places his seal on 144,000 people, saying that they will not be harmed. Christians have always understood this to be the seal of baptism. The image of being sealed is taken from Ezekiel chapter 9, just before the Babylonian captivity. God places a mark of protection on their foreheads, on all those in Jerusalem who sigh and groan over the abominations that are being committed there. And what is this mark? It's the letter Tau, which in the Paleo-Hebrew script of the time was either an X or a cross. The early Christians saw this as the sign of the cross, placed on the foreheads of believers, even nearly 600 years before Jesus. This custom of blessing those being baptized by making the sign of the cross on their foreheads persists to this day. Anyone ever blessed their children that way? There you go. In Revelation 7, we see that God is protecting his people from evil. They are sealed by baptism. They are brought into his family. They are his sons and daughters. This doesn't mean they're necessarily protected from physical harm. This doesn't mean it's going to be a rosy path, but it means they are protected eternally. So, why 144,000? And why from the 12 tribes of Israel? Well, 144,000 is 12 tribes of Israel times 12 apostles times 1,000, a huge, huge number. So 144,000 signifies all of God's people. So the Jehovah's Witnesses say it means that only 144,000 people are going to heaven. Don't listen to them. I, 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 I hate to make fun of the Jehovah's Witnesses, but that, that belief is out there, and I, I got to smack that one down. All right. But they, so, do, they do preach the word more than in Catholics do. Yes, they do. They're fervent evangelists. I will they absolutely give them that. So why are these people then all described as being from the 12 tribes of Israel? Well, consider the mission of the Messiah. A lot of you have seen Bishop Barron's Catholicism series. In that first episode, Bishop Robert Barron describes the four tasks of the Jewish Messiah. To gather the tribes, to cleanse the temple, to deal with the enemies of Israel, and to reign as Lord of the nations. We see that happen in Jesus' first coming. We see that happen more fully in the book of Revelation, right? Here, Jesus is gathering the tribes of Israel. After this, John sees part, part two of the vision. John sees a great multitude which no one can count from every nation, from all tribes and peoples and tongues. They're robed in white, waving palm branches, and they worship God and the Lamb. An angel tells John that these are the people who have come out of the Great Tribulation, and they have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. Saying that they've come out of the Great Tribulation implies that these are martyrs, especially martyrs from the final persecution. But it also seems to include all the faithful, all those who have run the race and fought the good fight, fought the good fight and been washed clean by the blood of Jesus, and been given that white robe. Imagine what chutzpah took in John's day to describe the church that way. In his day, the church was a few thousand highly persecuted individuals in a small room of the Mediterranean. But he sees this countless multitude, way more than 144,000, from every nation, every tribe, every tongue. And he was right. One of the elders tells John, now they will hunger and thirst no more. The sun will not strike them, nor any scorching heat. The lamb in the midst of the throne will be their shepherd, and he will guide them to springs of living water, and God will wipe away every tear from their eye. These are all promises from the book of Isaiah, these particular ones from chapter 49. Isaiah makes a huge number of promises concerning the future reign of the Messiah, 
Not just these, a whole bunch more. He says, the wolf will lie down with the lamb. The people shall beat their swords into plowshares. John seems to be telling us that while Isaiah's prophecies concerning the reign of the Messiah are imperfectly fulfilled even now, they will be perfectly fulfilled in heaven, where God will be their shepherd. God will wipe away the tear from every eye. Any thoughts on chapter 7? When they list the 12 tribes in that chapter, Dan's left off the list. Why? Because there's really 13 tribes, but you can't make it, you can't write 13 tribes because it's not a perfect number. And so they had to leave someone off. And, and apparently there's this tradition attached to Dan, who's famous for having the golden calf in the city of Dan, that, that they get left off for this reason. But really it's kind of a, well, who are you going to leave off? You, usually the Levites are left off because they didn't inherit the land of Israel. But you can't leave out the Levites on the list of people going to heaven. Um, I'm just going to say that for almost everything in the book of Revelation, everyone has a slightly different take on just about everything. If I went through every one, we would never leave, and this would be an incredibly boring class. All right. And now we come to the seventh seal and the prayers of the saints. The seventh seal is upon us. What's going to happen? Fire? Destruction? Nuclear war? No. No. When the Lamb opened the seventh seal, there was silence in heaven for half an hour. Why silence? Because worship and prayer are more powerful than all the weapons of the world. This half hour of silence represents the Jewish rite of offering incense in the temple. The priests would offer the incense in silence while the multitude silently prayed. And here we see the exact same liturgical rite going on in heaven. An angel comes and stands at the altar with a golden censer, and he is given much incense to mingle with the prayers of the saints upon the golden altar before the throne. The smoke of the incense rises with the prayers of the saints before God. Then the angel takes the incense burner, fills it with fire from the altar, and throws it on the earth. Now, fire has been kindled on the earth, and we'll see what happens next time.